everybody. I'm Leman. Um, I'm at Stony Brook, and in two weeks I'll be at Carnegie Mellon. Um, and uh, I will be talking about uh, communities and anomalies today in a special kind of data, attributed networks. Uh, my general research area is in graph mining and anomaly detection. So I'll try to tie these things today. Uh, we know that networks are everywhere, and that's because a lot of natural phenomena can be represented as a graph, right? Such as the who eats whom network, the interactions between the proteins, the interactions between social beings, and as well as the man-made uh, phenomena, such as the uh, hyperlinks between web pages or the uh, links between autonomous system and so on. So the list can be extended. And there are many fundamental graph uh, problems out there, right? So you have seen many of these uh, in the subjects of the spotlights earlier, such as uh, how do we find the most important node in a graph? Um, how do we partition a graph and find communities? How do we do inference? How do we detect anomalies? And, and many, many more uh, problems around graphs, right? So what's happening these days is that these graphs are becoming richer. And what do I mean by that is that um, not only we would observe, for example, uh, web pages linking to each other with hyperlinks, but we would observe, let's say, other kinds of entities interacting with these web pages in different ways, such as clicking a page, scrolling down a page, um, reading a page. And these entities would also have some additional information about them, which is often called as metadata, such as the topic of the web page, the keywords used, and so on and so forth. So what you would be looking at this a uh, very um, heterogeneous network, right? So later in the afternoon in this workshop, you'll hear from Yuju more about that. What I'm going to focus on is a very special kind of heterogeneous network called attributed network. And what I mean by that is that it would be a graph, uh, a homogeneous graph with the same type of nodes and edges, such as individuals, let's say, um, doing phone calls between each other or emailing each other, where each node would be associated with, with one or more properties, all right? So you would have these individuals, uh, let's say, calling each other. But in addition, you would know, for example, and maybe these form some communities, if you will. And in addition, you would know the age of the person. You would know maybe the location of these people. You would know their job titles. You would know their education level, their likes, political leanings, and all that. All right? So you would have this homogeneous network. But in addition, if you will, you can imagine a vector of attributes associated with these nodes in the network. So that's what I will be calling as an attributed graph. And this also is a very general phenomenon. You can represent many different data sources as an attributed network, uh, such as these social networks with profile information, such as demographics of people as attributes. You could have protein-protein interaction network, where you could think of the genes in which the protein is used for the encoding as the attributes of the proteins. Um, the web graph, where maybe the topics of the web pages would be the uh, attributes, and so on and so forth. Right? So when we go back to this list of fundamental problems that people have been looking at in graph mining, um, and when you have this additional information of no node attributes, maybe the approach that you would take to answering these questions would be changing. Right? So if you think about um, authority, right, ranking the nodes in a network, maybe if I know more about the person, I know some metadata about the person, maybe I should be thinking about how to do the ranking in a different way. Or uh, same for community detection. Um, if I know more about the nodes in the network, maybe that should, how would that imp impact the community detection? Uh, if I know more about these people, uh, would I do the link prediction in a different way and so on? So with the addition of these new information, maybe the, the problems remaining the same, maybe the approaches would be different to these problems. So in this talk, I will be particularly focusing on two such problems, um, being scoring um, and querying in attributed networks. And particularly, my focus will be subgraphs. So scoring subgraphs by quality, and I will introduce a motivating application there, as well as querying for subgraphs in an attributed graph. And here, when I say subgraph, it's also a general term. So you can think of maybe social circles of friends defined by humans, or communities you may think of as subgraphs that are extracted by a community detection algorithm. You can think of ego networks that are also precisely defined as the nodes and their direct neighbors induce. So you have a collection of such things. And you would be interested in scoring and querying them for the applications that I'll introduce. So the talk is two parts. So let's start with the first. So the motivating application or the motivating question for us for scoring attributed subgraphs was that if we are given a collection of such subgraphs, 
um, how, would I, how would we find anomalous ones? And here, this is a very vaguely defined problem right now, right? So here, the attributes of subgraphs would be maybe social circles as defined by Google Plus users, um, such as maybe people would have grouped some of their neighbors as family members, some of them as the people that went to the same university, some of them friends at work. Um, and you can imagine these social circles overlapping, right? So I would have maybe some people that went to the same university with me that work at the same college uh, and so on. So given this bunch of uh, social circles, how would I find the poor ones, right? And here is, this is really a vague problem and we need to you know, make it more concise. Um, so, but in order to do this, right, I, I need a scoring function um, sort of to differentiate between good and bad uh, social circles. And um, in anomaly detection, usually we don't know what an anomaly is, right? So it's a very unsupervised task. Um, what is it really? Um, and the flip side of the same coin is actually pattern mining. So if you know how the, how the no data uh, looks like in, uh, at large, right? What are the normal uh, patterns in the data? Then you could have a scoring function and find anomalies as deviations from these. So a flip side question to the uh, you know, poorly defined subgraphs would be something like, can I find the normal ones, and associated with it, a scoring function of quality of these subgraphs. All right? um, and so there are many measures of quality for a given, uh, let's say, community or social circle in, in, in general for graphs. And uh, most of them are structure only, right? So you may think of, OK, these people, the members of the social circle, should be maybe densely connected. They should all know each, each other. So you can have a structure only measure that only looks at the internal structure. And average degree is an example of this. So the higher, maybe the better. And there are some other measures, such as the cut edges or the cut ratio, that looks at how many edges are going out of the circle. So ideally, if the circle is really well defined, maybe only a few edges are going outside. And there are measures such as conductance that actually takes care of both, right? So both internal structure of densely connectivity and external structure of maybe loosely connectivity, loose connectivity. Um, so what we want to do here is bring in the attributes into the picture, right, for this kind of storing function. And now that I know something about these nodes, should I be thinking about scoring these subgraphs in a different way? All right, so before I go into the math, right, I would like to show you some uh, pictures and just to pictorially maybe try to convince ourselves that um, these two social circles are maybe higher quality, right? Just intuitively, pictorially. And uh, here what you see is the nodes inside these circles are the nodes that belong to the circle, social circle. And the nodes right outside are the boundary, right? Direct neighbors outside the circle. And the color here indicates uh, the exhibition of uh, binary attributes such as, you know, smokes or non not smokes. Um, so you would think that you know, these nodes are well connected and they are different from their external members or they are very sparsely connected to the rest of the graph, so maybe these are good ones, right? High quality. And if I show you two other examples here at the bottom, you may maybe think that these are lower quality because um, they are not really well connected inside. They have a lot of external connections. Um, and the existence of a behavior like smoking behavior, let's say, inside the circle is sort of a coin toss, right? There is no consistent notion of a sharing of an attribute. Okay, so with this intuition, we introduce this uh, measure called normality. And I'm going to give you the intuition first. So coming down to the internal, right? So what do we want internally the social members to exhibit? We want them to know each other well, right? So structural density, a lot of edges inside. But in addition to that, intuitively, we want the members of the social circle to click together around some interest. Right? So people maybe come together because they like both chess and biking, and so this sort of um, the notion of homophily brings them together. And not only homophily, so what this, what this implies is that we expect in this high dimensional attribute space a few attributes on which the members of the community um, you know, agree on. They, they just share these in common. And this can be because of homophily, which brings them together, or it may also be social influence, right? So you may be uh, influencing your peers and they may change their behavior the way that you are. Okay. okay, so this is for internal. So we also want to incorporate the boundary. So intuitively, we would want something like loose connectivity to the rest of the graph, right? So the social circle is well-defined, it's separate from the rest of the graph somehow. Or, right, even if they are not, if, even if they are well connected to the rest of the graph, um, we may want some external separation. And here, I'm going to talk about something called exoneration, which is something that we introduced in this work. Um, 
with uh, more pictures. Okay. So what do I mean by exoneration at the boundary? So the motivation for this is coming from some existing work. So the first work is that uh, by Yuri Leskovich back in 2008, uh, which showed that there are no good cuts in real worlds, right? So this means that there is this core in the network with very big hubs, very highly connected nodes. And it's really hard to partition a graph and find good communities because they're connected to everybody, right? By definition, a hub connects to everyone. The second motivating work is actually by Julian uh, McCauley here. So he, he has um, showed that through analysis of a lot of uh, ground truth circles that social circles overlap. Right? There's, they are not really partitions, they have uh, joint members. So when we look at pictorially, imagine that this is a subgraph that I'm trying to score. In the first phenomenon, you would observe a big hub outside the circle, such as Justin Bieber, right? Everybody is following him. A lot of boundary edges are you know, observed at the boundary of this social circle. In the second case, you would observe two social circles overlapping at each other. And because I expect each of them to be dense internally, I would observe a lot of cottages at the boundary for each one, right? But do I really need to think of these edges as important so that should they reduce the score or the quality of these circles? We argue that the answer is no. We should be exonerating these edges. So in the first case, right, I expect these edges because everybody, by definition, hubs are connected to everybody. So the existing go, existence of these edges at the boundary should not take away from the quality of the subgraph. I should just count them less. And under a null model, we'll be able to do this because they're just expected. In the second case, these uh, cross edges at the boundary of, let's say, the blue circle, we will be exonerating them by a different focus. So even though these two, do, two circles are overlapping, one of them are, is you know, people that like chess and maybe the other one is people that like uh, gardening and somehow, you know, these people are different than the blue ones and these edges at the boundary should be exonerated. All right, so we should be incorporating the exoneration in the formulas so that the quality of these, uh, the blue uh, subgraph shouldn't diminish due to those, all right? So mathematically now, um, sorry about some math, but you, if you get the intuition, it's very simple. What we have is uh, the normality score. It has two components, the internal and the external quality. In the internal case, what did I talk about? Um, the density, right? So AIJ is um, one if two nodes are connected inside the circle. And over here, um, you would have the probability of these nodes being connected to each other under a null model. Um, if, the, if you would create a random graph with the same degree distribution where KI is the degree of node I, and the normalized by the number of edges in the graph. Okay, so you're basically saying how surprising is this edge? How expected is this edge between two nodes inside the circle? So if the more surprising it is, the better, right? The higher the normality. But in addition, remember the second part about the attributes. Not only I want density inside the circle, I want a subspace in which they all uh, agree on the values of this um, behavior. So this is sort of a similarity function that says where xi is the attribute vector of node i, and it compares the, the attribute similarity of these two nodes inside the circle under a focus, right? So this is a weight vector, basically, if you will. It's a weighted similarity that is highly weighted for the shared attribute space that they have, and like people that like both chess and biking, all right? So the higher uh, both of these quantities are, the higher the normality. So the second part is the external, right? So the boundary, who they are connected outside the circle. So here again, the first part is really this null model, right? The less, the, the less surprising the edges at the boundary are, the less they discount, the, the less they take out from the normality. Notice the negative sign, all right? So I'm exonerating the less surprising edges at the boundary. Um, and um, so the second part is the similarity. So even if there are many edges at the boundary, maybe the nodes outside the circle are different, right? So this is the second picture earlier where the focuses of two overlapping communities are different, okay? So I'm also exonerating those. So overall, you have the scoring function. And um, we can actually use this as a quality score to find anomalies. So we call it anomaly mining of entity neighborhoods or AMEN. And uh, what you have is actually this uh, scoring function that I introduced earlier, uh, where I will now uh, just pull out the weight vector outside, all right? And um, basically just given this weight vector, I can just compute the normality um, and that's it, right? But what happens here is that given a social circle, I don't really know the subspace or the attributes that they just share, right? So this W vector is actually latent, it's unobserved. 
So then how, how do I know why these people are friends? Uh, why do they form a social circle? Well, what we will do actually is that we'll try to infer this such that um, the normality is maximized. So I'm looking for a subspace, a weight vector, that makes a given circle as normal as possible under the definition of this measure, right? So it becomes an optimization function, even though it's unsupervised. So I'm, I'm just to make this, you know, um, avoid the, the trivial solutions, right? I need to add some constraints, such as maybe the norm of this vector under some, uh, you know, one norm or two norm should be one. And I'm interested in non-negative weights so that I can interpret the subspace on which that they agree. So I'm going to try to solve this optimization function, and it is really easy to solve, all right? So if we, if we introduce this as a vector that we can simply compute from the data, all right, the solution becomes the following. So if you're interested in the L1 normalization here, basically the solution picks up the attribute with the largest positive value in this x vector, all right? And if, the, if you're interested in the L2 norm, so what it does is it picks all the positive uh, values in this vector. So it's linear in the number of attributes. It's a very fast solution. And because subgraphs are small, you're not really interested in scalability in the subgraph size, but you're interested in scalability in the number of attributes because you have millions of them. So that scales really well. All right? So uh, the normality then becomes under L2, basically the L2 norm of the x vector over here uh, that's induced on the positive values. Okay, so it's, it's very scalable, it's fast, um, and the optimization problem is very simple, and you're inferring the subspace automatically. So illustrative examples here are um, from DBLP. So this is the red nodes are the, some four authors, and this is the subspace that we inferred for them. These are people basically working on telescopic op-amps, and the, you can see the boundary, right, the direct neighbors outside the circle. And there are many edges, actually, these people do collaborate with others, but this doesn't take away from the normality because none of the people outside the circle focus on this subject, right? So we are exonerating by, you know, difference in scope or focus. Um, and uh, another similar example here. So, um, and coming back to the earlier pictorial examples that I showed, um, so you can see that here we actually get a very large positive uh, normality score for this uh, subgraph and this that I showed before, and for the poor ones, we get negative score. What happens here is that basically your x vector earlier that I introduced doesn't have any positive entries. So if you cannot find a focus on which the, pe the people of a, members of a circle focus on, then we deem it as uh, poor quality, right? And they, they get the only largest negative entry and a negative normality score. So we have done some experiments here and compared to some other measures that I introduced earlier, such as average degree, conductance, those that ignore the attributes, uh, by, sim by simulations of um, social circles, ground truth social circles, and um, I'll skip those details here. But what you can do with the normality is actually you can do a bit of a data analysis. So we had uh, several attributed networks, um, such as DBLP and, and several others. And what we were interested in is it, its relation to the other measures, such as conductance. So we could uh, look at the normality score of the communities or the social circles we had with respect to their conductance as measured by another measure that doesn't uh, look at the attributes, right? And they are correlated. So the larger conductance is a worse um, uh, subgraph usually. And normality also drops, as you can see, by larger conductance. So they are correlated, but there are many differences. For example, there are circles for which the conductance is very poor because there are many edges at the boundary, but their normality is very high because those edges actually can be exonerated. All right, so this is the main difference between the two. We can also look at another uh, uh, net network, actually Google Plus circles. Here we see actually that, again, there is correlation with larger conductance, the normality also drops. But this is the zero line, so most of the circles are actually very poor under this measure. Um, and so you can track these, maybe look at the distributions of them. So these, the circles in these two graphs seem to be better than the other ones where the normality is zero is actually in the middle. So you can do some data science. You can look at what attributes or how many attributes out of millions are relevant. Uh, we observe that uh, the relevance of the attributes actually drop very fast. So only a few things are important to bring people together um, in social networks. After 20, it essentially uh, drops to zero. Okay, in summary, um, so we introduced a new quality measure for scoring attributed subnetworks called uh, normality. So it incorporates uh, all of uh, internal and boundary quality, structure and attributes, 
Um, it uh, uses this notion of the focus of the social circle as well as the notion of exoneration. So here the, we also infer the focus automatically um, and um, it's, it's, it's scalable in a number of attributes. So as you can see in the beginning, as I said, when you have the additional information of attributes, how do we start thinking about the you know, fundamental problems of graphs differently? And this is one example here where we went back and you know, considered attributes in, um, in scoring subgraphs. So I'll move on to a, a second uh, piece of work here on querying uh, subgraphs. And uh, there are similar terminology, such as the focus you'll see, but the scenario is a bit different. In this case, again, you are given an attributed network like the one on the right-hand side, but um, because we are interested in querying, there will be a user that wants to do something with this network, right? So they'll be interested in some, sort, some, some communities in this network of a certain kind. So here we can give some you know, examples, uh, potential examples, such as maybe a salesperson being the user who is selling cosmetics, and maybe they're interested in finding target groups of people in this network, but they are not interested in all sorts of clusters, right? They're interested in of people of the same age, gender, and maybe income, because that matters. Um, or we can think of this network as being a network of sky objects connected through closeness in space, and maybe an astronomer is interested in finding you know, clusters of sky objects with the same with a certain uh, level of light and density. All right? So you're not interested in partitioning the entire graph. You're not interested in finding all the cl possible clusters in the graph. You're actually interested in chipping out of or extracting clusters of interest, if you will, from this graph. All right? So it, this is the notion of query, and it depends from user to user. So what we call here the interest of the user is also uh, the focus. And, um, and oftentimes what happens is that maybe the people, the users, are not um, able to provide the focus attributes directly. They may not say, find me clusters of you know, same age and uh, same income, but maybe they know the kind of uh, individuals that they're interested in to target. So coming back to the salesperson, right? Um, rather than providing income and age as the focus attributes, they may have actually uh, people who have responded to their tar ads. So the response group versus the non-response group. And they're interested in finding more people of the same um, group as the ones that responded. So they may provide some examples of such individuals based on which we can actually infer what their intent is. And then based on this, do the task of the cluster extraction. So more formally, then the problem is we have the attributed network. We have these exemplar nodes uh, given by the user as input. We infer their intent. Then we go out to the graph and extract the kind of clusters they will be interested in. Um, and then uh, also find some outliers. So I'll introduce what the outlier is with an example. So imagine that you have this collaboration network of people and you, you know information about their degree, where they live, uh, the language they speak, where they work. And imagine somebody gives as an exemplar set, Jan LeCun and Foster Provost. So we would learn a focus from this being that the education level and the location of these people are the same. So um, these two are bold. And we would go to the uh, graph and find clusters around which people come together based on their location and education level, all right? And so this would be the task. While doing so, we may be able to find some outliers, basically people that belong to a community but differ in some attribute value. Um, so here there are many, so some differences from the earlier work. As I said, there are many graph clustering uh, approaches out there, right? But here the goal is not really clustering the entire graph, but extracting clusters. And also the notion of uh, you know, outlier detection and finding an attribute subspace um, are other things. So pictorially, given the graph, the user comes in, they give some example nodes in the graph, then we infer the focus, their intent, what they, what they want to find in the graph, extract the clusters, and maybe find some outliers and return them. All right, so this is the flow. And I will, I will introduce you to these two uh, and how we do the inference first. So given the example uh, nodes, what we're gonna do is actually approach the problem as a distance metric learning problem, right? So we have some positive examples from the user. We will form some pairs of similar sets, and then we will find random pairs of other nodes, and we will construct this dissimilar set, and uh, based on which we'll try to find a you know, discriminating plane between these two. And uh, distance metric learning was first introduced by Eric Shing while he was back in Berkeley, and the objective function is really try to find a subspace 
that may, f here is the attribute vector of the nodes, try to make the uh, nodes in the similar set as close to each other as possible while making sure that the same spice, subspace make the, uh, the nodes in the dissimilar pairs as far away as possible. So it's discriminating subspace really, right? So you can solve this uh, optimization function really fast if you're looking for an, A here is a matrix actually, but if you're looking for a diagonal matrix, it's very fast. So that's what we, we also did. And uh, you get yourself the focus using distance metric learning. Given the focus, now the task is to go back to the graph and extract these uh, clusters. And um, the way we do it is a local approach, right? Because remember, we are not trying to partition the graph, but start from somewhere and that is really relevant and then grow around it and extract these relevant clusters only. So it's going to be a local algorithm. And it has two procedures. The first one is where do I start from? And how do I uh, expand around the starting point to extract the relevant ones? So the first step is finding uh, the relevant starting points. And what we did here is very simple. So given the um, subspace that we inferred in the previous step, we can reweigh the edges and really induce it on the higher weighted ones. And the connected components of this would be probably the uh, places where these attributes are relevant for the nodes on, the, on those regions. And we treat them as the starting points, the seed sets. And then the next step is growing around these seed sets, right? And the way we approach to this is to use a measure called a weighted conductance, all right? At that time, so this paper was written before normality. If it was today, probably we would be using normality. Uh, but the goal is to really keep adding, look at the local neighborhood of the current set and keep adding and ex, uh, deleting nodes from this set uh, as long as the conductance, weighted conductance by this focus increases. So if you keep doing this, you will get, you know, you will have a stopping con uh, point. And uh, you will also be able to find outliers, basically nodes that look like they would belong to the community, but they don't because they don't exhibit the characters. They're loosely connected. So the output is basically these expanded sets and potential outliers, if any. Okay, so we can look at the performance and compare to graph clustering approaches that do not really focus on attributes. And we can show that it's doing better. We can compare if the, when increasing the number of unfocused clusters right, uh, because we're interested in only a subset of the graphs and the other uh, algorithms would be probably um, affected negatively. And some uh, examples uh, from real world networks. So here um, we provided some, you know, people in data mining as exemplars. You, uh, we, you could learn that the subspace is data mining and you would probably, this is an extracted subgraph that focuses on data mining. Um, and you can see a lot of connectivity inside, and we would find a focused outlier such as uh, Cameron Marlowe here. It turns out that he, she has been written, uh, he has been written a lot of papers with uh, people in, the, in core data mining, but um, being an IR person. And in political blogs, we had a very interesting scenario. Again, the focus was um, certain, you know, um, democratic related uh, keywords, and we found this uh, blogger who actually do cite other democratic blogs, but he would have never got into the issue of this, uh, you know, subject uh, that was a bit controversial. Okay, so in summary, so we were looking into this paradigm of uh, doing graph clustering, where the clustering is steered by a focus as well as user preference, and we introduced the problem of, you know, focused clustering and um, outlier uh, extraction. So to wrap up, um, the networks are getting richer. We know more about the nodes. We know more, more about the edges. And the nature of these problems are really changing. The, the, the problems being the same, the approaches are really changing. We can do for probably better with the additional knowledge of attributes or um, the heter heterogeneity of the uh, networks. And I particularly talk about clustering and anomaly detection with the view of attributes. And probably there are many other um, areas um, that, could, um, that could need attention. All right, so uh, to finalize, so I'm moving to CMU in two weeks, as I said. I'm looking for a postdoc, so if you're a PhD student who's graduating and want to continue on academic line, or if you have a good student that is graduating, uh, please do contact me at this uh, address. That's it. <laughs>